Welcome to Investing Compass. Before we begin, a quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature. It does not take into consideration your personal situation, circumstances, or needs. So today we're going to do another installment of our deep dive into ETFs, where we look at popular ETFs and see what their top holdings are. But before we do, Mark, you love going on holiday and you haven't been able to, and you finally went on a little holiday this weekend. I mean, I've been I've been trying to go on more holidays. <laughs> But yes, I, I went to Tasmania. Yeah, you had a successful holiday because normally it either gets cancelled or moved or rained on or... Yes, no, the weather no. <laughs> the weather is actually... It was great. It was nice to be away from, you know, rainy Sydney. Mm. And it's bad news if you live in Sydney and you're going to Tasmania for better weather, right? <laughs> but Exactly. Um, so tell us what you did. Well, you know what I did. Um, I... Let's see. The highlights. I went skeet shooting. Mm-hmm. I thought was were you uh, successful? Yeah, yeah. It took me a little bit to warm up, but Mm -hmm. let's say I hit six in a row at one point. Okay, which I thought was pretty impressive. And then I did this like oyster experience where you put on waders and you go out and you eat the oysters and drink champagne on a table floating, you know, in the middle of the water. Sounds fancy. I mean, I guess yeah, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) And you shucked an oyster. I did. I did. Uh-huh. I had to work work for my oysters. And you did uh, You did message me and say that you learned a lot of facts that would make you seem extremely obnoxious to people. So did you want to share one of those facts? Well, no, I don't want people to think I'm obnoxious. <laughs> I'm just saying that like, if you go out for oysters with me, I can tell you a, a lot about them. Okay. Is there something you can share with us now? I mean, nothing that, that people probably want to hear, okay. <laughs> but I learned about their whole life cycle and, mm. you know, sorting them and just all sorts of just oyster minutia, right? All right. Well, maybe people want to hear about our episode. Well, then about our episode, not yeah. the oysters. Yeah. I was going to say, I was going to say, if they want to, if they want to hear about oysters, they can take can me do out a, for oysters. Yeah, or we can do a special episode on oysters. Do you remember, remember when we had our million dollar cocktail? Yes. Which we didn't actually have. Nobody, by the way, wrote in and said they want to take us out for a drink. Um, I, yeah, think, we're still I think we're fun. Yeah, I think going out with us would be fun, but I guess I'm wrong. Yeah, maybe. Should we do this episode? Let's do it. All right. So you said we're going to talk about ETFs, mm-hmm. and we are. And normally when we do this, we use active ETFs just because we think it's kind of interesting that some professional fund manager is picking securities to go into this. And then we can talk about what our analysts think about. But today, we're also going to talk about a few passive ETFs as well. And we think that this is important. More and more investors are investing passively. And in a lot of cases, if you're investing in market capitalization-weighted indexes, you're going to be taking some pretty big bets, regardless of whether someone is actively picking stocks. So what we'll do today is look at some of the largest and most popular passive ETFs for their sectors. Then we'll get into a couple of active ETFs too. It's always interesting to see where professional managers are taking active bets. So let's get into the lineup for today's episode. Yeah. So Sean said, we'll start with passive and we're going to get back to the basics here. So we're going to look at the ASX 200 and we'll look at the Spider S&P ASX 200 ETF with the ticker symbol, symbol STW. Then we'll look at the S&P 500 through the iShares S&P 500 ETF with the ticker symbol IVV. And there, of course, shouldn't be any surprises about top holdings, but we'll go through and look at how heavy the exposure is and what our analysts think of them. So let's start with the Spider S&P ASX 200 ETF. This ETF is designed to mimic the ASX 200, the 200 largest companies in Australia by market capitalization. When we look at concentration, 46% of the fund is in the top 10 assets in a fund of 200, so it's very concentrated. 24% of the investment is in basic materials, 30% in financial services. 27% of the holdings have wide moats, so these are companies that we believe can maintain a sustainable competitive advantage over 20 years or more. 29% of the holdings have a narrow moat, so can maintain that sustainable competitive advantage over 10 years or more. That concentration makes sense. We're looking at the largest companies in Australia. Their size doesn't come about from not being able to protect and grow their earnings. So if we looked at small cap or micro cap in Australia, it would be hard to spot one company with a moat in the index. So let's take a look at the holdings. Well, the top holdings, BHP. And we've we talked about this before, right? We talked about how it was dual listed in Australia and the UK, and it was ending its London listing and coming back to Australia would make up a big part of the index. And guess what? It did. 
So BHP is almost 11% of the index, and that's huge. That if you invest in this ETF or any product that tracks ASX 200, you're getting 11% in one company. And, you know, I think you'd be well aware that you have a large concentration in miners and financial services, but an 11% bet on a single company is huge. And I think we'll see when we look at some active funds that it would be pretty unusual for a fund manager to take on an 11% position in their fund. So, and that's even when these people are paid to have extreme conviction in the prospects of the companies that they put into an active fund. And so as it stands, we think that BHP is overvalued and trading at a 26% premium to fair value. As we recall this, BHP is valued at $39 and is trading at $49.30. We don't think that BHP has a moat. Low-cost iron ore is expected to generate excess returns for BHP, but this is only one part of a large business. It doesn't have enough influence on overall business outcomes to create a moat. BHP's other core divisions like petroleum, which was recently sold off, copper, coking coal, nickel, etc. BHP just doesn't have an advantage in those divisions to own a moat. And when we look at their business outlook, we've seen recently the impact of supply shocks on the commodities market with the war in the Ukraine, and then obviously the subsequent sanctions on Russia. And we've seen the market react to this by really trying to control demand by having prices go up. And our analysts think it's too early to forecast that these demand changes and price increases are going to last into the future. So that has not been factored into our fair value estimates. Okay, so let's move on to the next heavy hitter, and that's CBA, the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, which makes up 8.19% of the investment. Similarly, we think CBA is trading at a premium of about 29%. Our fair value is at $83. As we record this, the price for CBA is around $106. And we do rate CBA with a wide moat. So it is the largest of the big four banks in Australia. And collectively, these four banks control 75% of business and consumer lending and a similar share of deposits. So Commonwealth Bank derives its moat from two sources, cost advantage and switching costs. So cost advantages are supported by a low-cost deposit base, operating efficiency, and just the fact that they're pretty conservative with their underwriting relative to their peers, which means that they have higher standards on who they lend to. With switching costs, banks are a classic example of this type of moat. When you bank with a certain company, you find it difficult to leave because of how burdensome it would be. Lots of red tape, forms, applications. If you have a mortgage or a credit card, You'd have to find suitable products at a competitor also. So people often put it in the too hard basket and they just leave it at the current bank that they're in. So a wide moat is good news. And our analyst, Nathan, thinks that the business is strong and in the long run is good at increasing shareholder wealth. But as it stands, the price is just not right. It is overvalued and sitting in two-star territory and five-star stocks are what we consider our best opportunities. All right, we're going to do one more, Shawnee in terms of the ASX. Mm -hmm. And the third largest company is CSL, and that has 5.7% of the index. Uh, 5.7% of the index is in CSL, not CSL has. (laughs) And a lot of us know about CSL. I'd say it's not as much of a household name as BHP and CBA, but CSL is one of three tier one plasma therapy companies. So these three companies basically have an oligopoly over the market. And they have a narrow mode based on cost advantage. They do large-scale plasma collection, which keeps their costs down, and they also have intangible assets based on the intellectual capital in its products. Our fair value for CSL is $290. It's currently trading at around $267, but this is within a range that we consider fairly valued for the business. But it is important to note that it has come down a bit and was trading for $336 in 2020. So when we collectively look at these companies, they're all either overvalued or fairly valued. And they're all pretty large bets given that allocation. And of course, one of these companies doesn't have a moat. So if we zoom out a little and look at the top 10 holdings in the S&P ASX 200 ETF, we see one company is undervalued. The rest are one, two, or three stars. So what does this mean as an investor Does this mean that you shouldn't invest in passive funds or you shouldn't invest in Australia large cap shares? Uh, So it means neither. 
So this exercise was purely demonstrative that it pays to know what you're holding and be aware of your exposure to sec- sectors and companies. It also illustrates that passive investing isn't always so passive. You're taking large bets on companies if you're not going for an equal weighted ETF, where the same amount of money is put into each company in the ETF, regardless of its relative size. Okay, we've got one more passive ETF, and we're going to turn our attention to the US, Shani, and the S&P 500 through the iShares S&P 500 ETF with the ticker symbol IVV. And for regular investing compass listeners, which you all should be, we often look at the top holdings of the S&P 500. So there shouldn't really be any surprises. But once again, the top two holdings are Apple and Microsoft. So Apple holds a commanding 7% of a 500 stock ETF, and Microsoft holds almost 6%. And our analysts seem to have differing opinions about these two stocks. We think that Apple is trading at a 34% premium. Its fair value is $130, and it's currently trading for around $174. And Apple's obviously pretty well known. And I think one of the things they're most well known for is the fact that their products just work. And being the largest firm in the world, they're naturally, of course, prone to a lot of competition, and they need to keep up with an ever-changing space, which means they'll continue to invest in R&D efforts and innovation in the coming years. However, we believe that the market is a bit too optimistic about revenue and earnings and estimate modest revenue growth in the low to mid-single digits after a really fantastic 2021. So Apple has a narrow moat. Let's speak a little about Apple's competitive advantages. It stems from Apple's ability to package its hardware, software, services, and third-party apps into a sleek and intuitive device. This expertise enables them to charge a premium, and they've developed quite a loyal customer base. However, we only assign a narrow moat because the consumer hardware space can be pretty unforgiving to firms that are unable to continue to satiate customers' appetites for new features. Yeah, and that's right, Shani. So given the fact that they have short product cycles, which basically just means they release iPhones every year, for example, um, and basically every other firm in the sector is going after them, because of those two factors, we can't afford them, we can't award them a wide moat. What does contribute to their moat is switching costs and intangible assets. Unlike the PC and smartphones that rely on open operating systems, Apple's products have a walled garden approach for iOS. And that allows them to charge a premium. So customer switching costs are elevated for Apple because the switch from iOS is not seamless. And for a lot of people would be difficult once they've been integrated into Apple's ecosystem. And I've actually had to do this once. I used Android phones until relatively recently. And the switch was really difficult to iOS. I had to repurchase all my apps. My data wasn't transferred. It was difficult to transfer a lot of of the media I had. And it was pretty much just a nightmare. And That was about five or six years ago. I imagine that there's been progress in making this process a bit more streamlined. But again, as Mark said, once you're in that ecosystem, you'd never really want to go through that process of removing yourself. And you were were an expert because you worked at Telstra (laughs) Telstra, when you were at uni. Yeah, I know. So if you couldn't do it, Yeah, well, it was just difficult. Um, It was a difficult process. And I mean, my stance was that I shouldn't pay $1,000 for a phone because I thought that was pretty ridiculous. But I just found myself cycling through Android phones much quicker than I would just the one phone. So here I am. Here you are. A convert. And you're happy? Yeah, I'm pretty happy. Well, other people are happy too. So recent data from the US shows that iPhone customers are not even contemplating switching brands today. So there was a December 2018 survey by Kantar saying 90% of US-based iPhone users said they plan to remain loyal to future Apple devices. And a recent survey in December 2021 from 451 Research indicates iPhone customer satisfaction is 98% for the iPhone 13 product family. So you are not alone, Shani. No. Apparently everyone's happy with their iPhone. Also, users of ancillary products, especially the watch and AirPods, both of which Shani has, lose (laughs) significant functionality when paired with a smartphone other than the iPhone. So we believe that existing iPhone users are relatively locked into the iOS ecosystem and interface. And you have an iPad, Shani. So you're you're like the queen of Apple. Apple poster girl. Exactly. Exactly. (laughs) And of course, intangible assets are centered around brand which really doesn't need much explanation, especially with Apple. Shani said before, is just seen as a brand that just works. Everything is seamless and the customer is 
place at the core of the functionality. So a narrow moat and a strong business, but we just think that the market has been too optimistic about Apple's 2021 results and projected that into the future, resulting in it being a two-star stock at present. So let's take a look at Microsoft. We're seeing Microsoft at a 14% discount, but rate it as a four-star stock. Its fair value is $352, and it was trading at $303.68 at last close. And you might have noticed just between Apple and Microsoft that the difference between the premium and discount is significant. A 34% premium for Apple, placing it as a two-star stock, and a 14% discount qualifies Microsoft as a four-star stock. And it seems like the scales aren't even, but that's because it is. And that's because we want a margin of safety as investors. That means we want some buffer between what we think a share is worth and how much we are willing to pay for it. That margin of safety accounts for imprecision in our calculation of the fair value and the fact that the future is unknowable. A big part of what goes into our fair value calculation is our estimates of how the company will perform in the future. And those estimates can be more or less uncertain based on the specific attributes of the company and their industry. So for companies with more uncertainty, we want a bigger margin of safety. For companies with lower uncertainty, we we couldn't accept a smaller margin of safety. All right. So when we look at Microsoft, we believe that since the CEO change in 2014, we've seen Microsoft pivot its business to invest in its future growth and letting go of low growth businesses like mobile handsets, and it's driving gaming to be more cloud-based. And Microsoft has a wide mode, according to our analysts, and that comes from switching costs, network effects, and cost advantages. And Microsoft Office is at the centerpiece of those switching costs. So it does seem like the white collar world would collapse without Excel and Shawnee would collapse just personally <laughs> without Excel, uh, Microsoft Outlook and Microsoft Word. And even though there are free alternatives, we believe it's just too ingrained in businesses to be threatened by a shift to another product. Office 365 is at the center of the network effect. A large installed base draws in software developers to create products specifically for Microsoft Office. For example, in the financial community, a wide variety of add-ins for Excel designed to smoothly integrate popular platforms such as Factset, Bloomberg, and Capital IQ have been created. But we don't talk about those brands here. We don't. No. no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you would even consider them. Um, so all in all, we believe that Microsoft is a good opportunity for people to research. And again, as with the iShares S&P 500 ASX 200 ETF, the purpose of this exercise is transparency and knowledge, knowledge of your holdings and what you're investing in when you're leaving the stock picking to a person, an index, or a theme. Morningstar Investor is built for investors by investors. It provides independent research and data on over 40,000 securities, tools to build and maintain an investment portfolio, and investor education resources to support you, regardless of where you are in your investing journey. Explore opportunities with our monthly global best ideas. Explore our ETF model portfolios. Plan better with two years of dividend forecasts for ASX listed stocks. And stay informed with independent thought leadership. We've built tools to help you construct, monitor and maintain your portfolio, including our portfolio manager. Integrated with one of Australia's leading portfolio tracking tools, ShareSight. Morningstar has been empowering investor success for over 35 years. We're passionate about your outcomes and are here every step of the way as you achieve them. Take out a free four-week trial to access our resources. Find the details in the episode notes. So let's move on and tackle some active funds. And we'll pick two ETFs that have been drumming up a, quite a bit of interest. So do you want to introduce them, Mark? The first one is Antipodes Global Shares ETF. That has the ticker symbol AGX1 which our analysts award a bronze medalist rating to. Second one is Magellan's Infrastructure ETF with the ticker symbol M-I-C-H, or Mitch, as I said, <laughs> although there's no T in it. M-I-C-H. We award this ETF a gold medalist rating. And as a reminder, the medalist rating is based on whether we think that the investment will outperform their category benchmark on a risk-adjusted basis. So let's start with Antipodes. When we look at what Antipodes says it wants to achieve in this fund, they say the fund features a very flexible approach to investing in global shares with the aim of generating attractive long-term returns while maintaining an emphasis on capital preservation. 
The strategy gives us the ability to profit from both rising as well as falling share prices. The fund's exposure to foreign currencies is actively managed with the aim of mitigating risk while enhancing returns. And the fund has 60 shares that are in it, and they're pretty broadly diversified across sectors. So 17% tech, around 10% in communication services, basic materials, and financial services, with a smattering across other sectors. And then if we look at regions, about half the fund is in North America, 22% in Europe, and 14% in Asia. So pretty broadly diversified. So let's have a look at their top stock. So their top stock is Santa Fe. So that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange with the ticker symbol SNY. So Santa Fe is in big pharma with their product line containing quite a few top tier drugs, including something I can't pronounce or We both can't pronounce. Well, maybe we can. We just don't know how to pronounce it. (laughs) Do Pixent. Do Pixent? Do Pixent? Do Pixent? Let's go with that. Well, either way, it's (laughs) apparently- It's popular. (laughs) It's popular if you have eczema. Okay. Um, So of my many ailments, that is not one, which is why I can't pronounce it. So Santa Fe also holds a strong position with several vaccines and rare disease drugs that are strong assets because they hold up well to pricing pressure. After all, if you've got a rare disease, chances are you're going to say yes to the treatment. So when we look at growth for Santa Fe, there are two main avenues that we see uh, that they're already harnessing. So the first is emerging markets. They're using their R&D group to bring new drugs to emerging markets. And the pricing is not as strong as developed markets, but the rapid economic growth that we're seeing in key markets has created new geographic markets for their drugs. The second is a history of successful acquisitions of drugs and drug companies that is likely to continue. They focus their acquisitions on rare disease drugs because the company has competitive advantages in this space and has experience in distributing these drugs. And when we take a step back and we look at their patents, economies of scale, and a powerful distribution network, that gives us reason to award Santa Fe with a wide moat. So Santa Fe's patent-protected drugs carry strong pricing power, which enables the firm to generate returns on invested capital in excess of its cost of capital. The patents also give the company time to develop the next generation of drugs before generic competition catches up with them. And while the company does have a diversified product portfolio, there is some product concentration, the largest drug which we mentioned. <laughs> Won't say the name again. And it I represents- think it's dux- it looks like Duxapent. I think we spelt it incorrectly. Well, I did because I wrote this s- in two places. <laughs> well, I don't know if you spelled it incorrectly in two places. You just weren't consistent. One yeah. could be right. <laughs> One could be right. So 50-50 chance. Um, but that drug represents close to 10% of total sales. Uh, but our analysts expect new products will mitigate the generic competition that's going to rise against it. We should have called it like Duxies. <laughs> you know? The Australians love to create shortcut nicknames for stuff. We do. This was an opportunity. Um, Anyway, let's talk a little (laughs) bit about the price and no longer the eczema treatment. So we believe that Santa Fe represents a fair opportunity and it's a four-star stock. So it's currently trading at $51.53 and its fair value is $59. So that's a discount of around 13%. And we look at Antipodes' case for Santa Fe, calls out the company's strengths, which are extremely similar to what we think about it at Morningstar. So no investment, of course, is without risk. And one that jumps out is Santa Fe is a pretty deep entrenchment in China that could come under duress just because they're seeing lots of companies coming under review from Chinese officials for drug marketing practices. All right. So their exposure does put them at risk here. And although they are well diversified, the threat of generic drugs is a constant worry. They must continue to keep acquiring or developing new drugs to replace the market share that generic drugs is taking away from them. And when we look at the US, their system revolves around health insurance. Health insurance companies in the US have pharmacy benefit managers. They manage drugs on behalf of health insurance and determine what is covered and what's not. These pharmacy benefit managers have started to push back on insulin pricing, one of Santa Fe's major products, due to less differentiation between the key drugs. And this means that it'll be a harder it'll be harder to fight for market share in this segment. But all in all, we think that they have a wide moat. I think it's a quality business that understands the challenges that are in front of them. 
Okay, so let's move on to one more fund, and that's Magellan's Infrastructure Fund with the ticker symbol MICH, or as Mark calls it, Mitch. This fund aims to hold 20 to 40 stocks that seek to deliver stable returns offered by infrastructure as an asset class, and it's hedged, so they seek to do this while protecting returns from currency movements. Their top holding is Transurban, which is 6.81% of a 30 holding fund. Now, we couldn't find a recent call out to why Magellan has put such a big stake in Transurban, perhaps because they're busy with other stuff. But (laughs) we can look at what our analysts think about this company. So we've spoken about Transurban a few times on this podcast, but they're one of the world's largest toll road operators. They have concessions on 14 Australian and three North American highways. And what concessions are is the right to operate and collect tolls from roads for a predetermined amount of time. And their core business is in Australia, where roads are integral to connecting our three major cities, Melbourne, Sydney, and Brisbane. This means that that the roads have strong competitive advantages and the assets generate attractive returns on initial investment, which warrants a wide economic moat rating for Transurban. So they have very defensive revenue. They own high quality infrastructure and there are attractive growth opportunities for Transurban, including widening of existing roads. So a pretty solid business. What we don't agree on with Magellan, though, is that it's an attractive opportunity at the current price. We believe it's trading at a 10% premium to our fair value, which sits at 12, and it's currently trading for 1320. That makes it a two-star stock. We believe, though, it is a quality business with strong growth potential, and I happen to own it, which probably means somebody will buy it because <laughs> every other Australian share that has I own bought. has been bought. So. Yeah, I don't I don't know if that's any sort of uh, you know, scientific predictor, but it <laughs> seems to be going that way. Yeah. Um okay, so what's the lesson we can learn from this? There are a couple. The first is that just because you are in a passive fund, it does not always mean that you are completely diversified. Just depending on the market, you could be overweight tech, industrials, mining, financial services. There's an easy way to lessen these tilts, an equal weighted ETF. But it's important to be aware of the underlying exposure regardless, as it will always tilt one way or another and impact how your portfolio behaves and performs. And adding to this is that sometimes these holdings and passive ETFs are larger than what you see with active managers that are acting with conviction. They are mandated to make big moves and place big bets. But in a lot of cases, the passive ETFs have larger bets. Then it's important to recognize that there are two sides to every bet. We agree with Hyperion on Sanofi, but we think that Transurban is fairly valued, if not slightly overvalued, whilst Magellan is holding strong in their position in their infrastructure fund, thinking that the market has mispriced Transurban. The point is that nobody has a crystal ball and we're all extrapolating data into the future. That's why we include margins of safety in our evaluations and look at both sides of the coin when we create a bull say and bear say list. What if we had the viewpoint of Magellan? What are the strengths that they see in Transurban that's going to grow their earnings and their business? Is it enough to overcome how we value the business? Exactly, Shani. And those are two things that all investors can do. Ensure that you have a margin of safety when you're making an investment. This is just a buffer that accounts for imprecision in the calculation of the fair value, which comes from the fact that humans make mistakes and the future is unknowable. It allows you to sleep better as an investor. You think that a stock is valued at ten dollars and is trading for nine dollars and fifty cents? Is that enough for you to take the jump? Then the bull say bear say list. We talk about lists a lot and writing things down, but this is really just to overcome the confirmation bias that we can succumb to as investors, seeking out information that confirms our own view. We know when we sell a share that there's another person on the other end of that trade that has the exact opposite view of the stock as us. It's a good habit to get into to understand that viewpoint, and if you're still willing to invest. You've only strengthened your conviction in that stock. So today was a big accomplishment for us. It was. We, we finished this episode. We only did one today. We only recorded one today, mm. but we've been on a streak. Yeah. So for the past, I think, four or five weeks, poor Will has had to record maybe two or three podcasts sometimes a week uh, just to keep up with our regular schedule, but also because we're all going on leave on we, holiday. We are. We are. So Will leaves first tomorrow. Yes. So I don't know what date it is. What's today? Today's the 29th. (laughs) Today's March 29th. It's all a blur, Mark. It it is all a blur. (laughs) So Will goes tomorrow, and then we both depart before Will gets back. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, exciting. We we did it. I'm going to the U.S., as you talked about. Mm -hmm. You're going to Tassie. 
But anyway, this gives us a little time not to record and we can think of some good ideas for our next streak, but you can also help us with that. So send an email to my email address. It's in the show notes. You can also send an email to me if you just want to say hi, arrange to take Shawnee and I out for drinks or (laughs) oysters, or if you want to sign up for our free webinars, for example, you can leave comments in our podcast app. It makes us really happy when we get one. We just got one the other day. And, you know, we text each Mark other about it. these things while he's on holiday, by the way. So that's very important to him. Well, he had to do something in between shooting clay pigeons and <laughs> eating oysters. But anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. We really appreciate it. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.